So the motivation of this uh, presentation is really a tribute to the late Ronald Coase. So Coase won the Nobel Prize in 1991, and he famously said, if you torture the data long enough, it will confess. Now, Coase actually was uh, a theoretician, uh, actually very interesting one too. Um, we overlapped at the University of Chicago when I was a student, but unfortunately he was hiding out in the law school. But interestingly, as a theoretician, uh, his papers had no equations, no mathematics in them whatsoever. Uh, that's not the case uh, anymore. But nevertheless, uh, let's start at this point. And what do I mean? So where I want to go, um, this is a wide ranging talk that uh, focuses not just on finance, but the way that we conduct science in general. So I will talk about strategic data selection. And this will focus when I talk about finance, not just on academic finance, but um, practitioner finance. I'll talk about some of the classic problems in data analysis, including delegation, the garden of forking paths, concepts that you might or might not be familiar with. I'll focus on the multiplicity of methods that are available uh, to us today. And it is striking the number of methods and it creates a dilemma because often people will pick the method of analysis that is most likely to support uh, their result. I'll talk about manipulation. I'll talk about a right fraud. I'll talk about uh, how to sample. And then at the end, I'll have some remarks on um, truth and the implications for investors. So let's start out with a white paper that crossed my desk. Uh, the topic, extremely interesting to me uh, by uh, a well-respected -respe um, uh, asset manager. And the topic is the overlooked persistence of active performance. So this is the sort of thing that I do research in, and I'm quite interested uh, in reading this paper. And it definitely uh, caught my eye. So the basic idea of the paper is to look at performance through a different lens. And I'm all for doing that. And looking at the abstract, uh, it says uh, very clearly that they want to reframe the conversation. And I really like that. I, I really like reframing uh, conversations. So, so what's the idea? There is a debate as to whether active managers outperform passive managers. So they're going to speak to this. And the idea, the innovation in their paper is to only include those managers in the top three quartiles of performance. Okay, let's think about that. So essentially, the bottom quartile of performers are deleted from the analysis. And uh, when you do that, 84% of active managers have beaten the passive benchmark. And they've got very detailed analysis that is actually pretty intuitive. So if you look at all funds in blue versus the top three quartiles, in every single situation, the top three quartiles does better than all of the data. Okay, so this is one of the, um, the tables uh, in the paper. Um, and it's, if you really reflect on this, it's really, really hard to figure this out. Like how, how can you actually present this? It's so obvious if you censor the data um, that the censored data is going to look better. So indeed, um, the conclusion here is that 100% of active managers beat the S&P when you delete all of the managers that underperformed. So that to me is not that meaningful uh, of a result and hopefully uh, you agree. So um, let me talk about another uh, situation um, in the context of st strategic data selection. 
So this is a very influential paper uh, that was commissioned by um, uh, Norges and uh, that currently has like assets under management of $1.1 trillion. So this was um, commissioned to look at the role, again, of active management. And again, I'm very interested in this topic given my uh, current research. So this is in the report, the 2014 report, all the stuff's online, um, including the previous uh, paper. So um, this is uh, the key line for me, and that is abstracting from the financial crisis. We conclude that active management of both equity and fixed income has significantly contributed to the returns of the fund. So again, let's step back. So essentially what's happening here is the model works. So active outperforms passive if you exclude the single most important economic episode in the last 30 years, the global financial crisis. So again, this is what I call strategic selection of data. Okay, so I've, in my research, uh, have been critical of the sort of methods that people use and have called out a number of researchers. Um, but I've also called out myself. And let me tell you a story. And this is a story that happened early in my career. And Duke University had an early version of call ID. A call comes in about 9 p.m. And I know the number um, is a general number at Goldman Sachs. And I've got colleagues from the University of Chicago that went directly to Goldman. And we regularly talk. So I just figured this is a, a conversation. No big deal. And I pick up the phone. And... Uh, say hello, and maybe, I forget exactly what I said, but it wasn't a particularly complimentary uh, thing to say. Um, and then there was a long pause. And then the senior voice said, is this Campbell Harvey? And then I knew, uh-oh, this is not one of my um, uh, school buddies. This is uh, somebody else. What's going on? And it turns out it was Fisher Black. So uh, to get a phone call from Fisher Black uh, as a junior person, that, that's just a huge deal. And it started out obviously very poorly. So then he says that he has a problem with a table that's published in um, the Journal of Financial Economics, uh, one of my first publications, and it had just come out. So that uh, actually, <laughs> got me uh, stressed a little bit, uh, to say the least. And the table was a table that basically was a, a market timing sort of model. So it was predicting one month ahead S&P 500 return. And uh, many people had documented that there's a, a small amount of predictability in the S&P 500 return. And this is the table uh, from uh, that paper. And he tells me that this table is an example of data mining. And he said that the predictability was way too good. Uh, it must be overfit. So uh, this is the particular uh, model that he's looking at. Uh, it's got an R squared of 7.5%. And I basically uh, said, no, this can't be uh, overfit um, because I only ran one regression. So this wasn't a data mining expedition whatsoever. Uh, it was a single regression. I didn't search over all the variables and I just reported what I got. So there was no attempt to maximize the fit. I was just following uh, previous literature. So uh, we had uh, a long conversation. He stuck to his guns, I stuck to my guns. So it's really interesting to me that this call so many years ago, uh, accusing me of data mining, uh, it's so ironic, given my current uh, research program, to basically call out uh, the data miners. So recently, I decided to do an out-of-sample test of the model that Fisher Black 
said was data mined. So um, the first thing you do is replication. And I had to collect the data. I didn't have the data that I used uh, in this old publication. So everything was collected. And it turns out that the uh, in sample replicated really well. So the R squared, 7.6%, and the original article was 7.5%. But what about the other sample? So when that happens, it's a different story. The R squared goes to zero. It's not significant, which is consistent with data mining. Indeed, uh, you can actually see in the data that some of the coefficients are very unstable. So it turns out Fisher Black was correct that this was an example of data mining. But how can it be data mining if I only ran one regression? And it turns out that the lesson here is that I might not have uh, tortured the data, but if I relied upon others that tortured the data, it causes the same problem. And this is what I call a delegation. Okay, let's uh, move on to the garden of forking paths. So this is a very subtle concept and it's sometimes described as the parallel universe problem. And this is much discussed by uh, a statistician that I've got a huge amount of respect for, Andrew Gelman. So uh, what is it? So think about the following uh, situation. There's somebody that wants to develop a factor or a trading strategy, and they've got 20 variables that they want to look at. So think of it as a prediction model. And they start out and variable one works. It's significant. And that researcher stops and then maybe that model goes into production. And they can say, well, uh, I just did one test. So there's no data mining whatsoever. I just did one thing. I didn't look at anything else. So we're good. So now I challenge you to think about the parallel universe where everything's the same. The researcher is the same. The 20 variables are the same, but the order that the variables were tested is reversed. So variable 20 is tried and it's not significant. Number 19, not significant. And dot, dot, dot. All the way to the first variable, nothing significant except that first variable. And what happens to the researcher? The researcher says, well, um, I tried 20 things. One happened to be significant, therefore nothing is significant because I can easily get one thing out of 20 by chance. So the lesson here is that both situations need to be treated the same. So even though that first researcher didn't try all the 20 variables, you need to actually um, engineer your inference as if they actually did try all 20. Okay. So now let's go back to practitioner work. And this is a high profile organization that I'll call GF. And this is a real uh, example. Um, and this stuff is on the internet. Um, but to basically frame this, I wanna go back to my Fisher Black situation um, to kind of show you what the data actually looks like. So this is the S&P 500 and in the orange, in the blue, are my predictions. And if you recollect over um, the first part of the sample, it was 7.5%, over the last part, 1%, so overall about 4%. So that's the R squared. And that's you can see it visually that the variance of the blue is really small compared to the variance of the orange. And that's why the R squared over the full sample is only 4%. So again, uh, the predictions in blue, the historicals are in orange. So um, let me uh, talk about uh, this conversation that 
I get a lot of phone calls, people wanting advice and almost always free advice. And usually I don't give them the time of the day, but this I just couldn't resist because it reminded me so much of the Fisher Black uh, situation. So they were also predicting monthly um, uh, stock returns. Uh, the difference is that they were going to look at not just the U.S., but 59 different markets. So um, there were some markets that were excluded, and I didn't have any problem with that whatsoever. Um, it's uh, these uh, markets have short sample and are illiquid, uh, but the big ones were, were all there. So it sounds very interesting. And um, they described it, and this is again on the internet, product of over two years of intensive data collection. And that they had tested roughly 200 monthly variables um, and the sample from the 1990s. And when you look at all of the monthly data, the 59 markets all together, plus the 200 variables, we're talking about um, 3 million data points. And then we learned that the analysis uses multi-stage uh, method and uh, the most advanced machine learning algorithms, plural. So of course, that's my first question. What algorithm did you use? Uh, for this analysis. And the person I was talking to wasn't forthcoming. And I think that's really important because within the machine learning space, there are lots and lots of methods. And it is so tempting to choose the one that actually works. So how accurate is the model? So they claim that the accuracy is impressive and for the big 25 economies, R squared of 0.96, and for all economies, 0.98. I'm thinking, okay, uh, that uh, they're probably thinking percentage, because remember, over the latter part of my sample, um, I got a R square of one, which is really close to 0.98%. No, it's not 0.98%, it's 98%. So let's take a look at that uh, graph that I showed you for my model. So the orange are the historical realized returns. The blue are the one step ahead predictions from this GF model. And that's what a 98% R-squared looks like. The variance is about equal. And the predictability is remarkable, especially Look at that October 2008. That was the worst month of the global financial crisis. There was a minus 35% return. And the predicted value at the end of September from this model was minus 35%. Okay, so what's going on here? Um, this model is massively overfed. And uh, you can actually see, uh, remember my model with the 4% R-squared, the GF model, 98% R-squared. Okay, so it's a huge difference. And it is, it is implausible to even think, if you got 98% R-squared, why would you publish it? Why would you put it on the internet? So, um, so again, uh, it doesn't really stop here. Uh, they claim uh, the other sample works also, where they hold out uh, some data. On further questioning, I found out that the data really wasn't held out. It was all within the program. So the other sample is questionable. So um, it doesn't really stop here. Uh, they claim they want to improve. 98% is not good enough. So they want to look at additional variables. They already have 200 uh, variables for uh, each country. And notice they don't even have 200 observations per country. They want to develop a nowcast and many other improvements are in store. So you can't really make this up. It's remarkable and this is what we see uh, today. Okay, let's go back to academia. This is a paper um, in uh, financial accounting. It was on the AAA program. 
And uh, I've got two examples here. Well, one finance, accounting, economics example, another one a little later. Um, I call this multiplicity of methods. So this research argues that there is a an upside to um, unionization within a firm. So after unionization, the, the risk that the stock price tanks or crashes decreases. Um, the economic mechanism is not clear, but as an empirical paper, let's look at the data. And they're going to use regression discontinuity design. So this is what it looks like. And notice that uh, the straight line in the middle is the 50% mark. So if the vote to unionize is less than 50%, then the union vote fails. And then you can see to the right, um, the union vote passes. And they argue that uh, when it passes, the, uh, the, the crash risk actually decreases. And you can see that with the gap um, at the 50% line of those two curves. But look at that data. Okay, so what's going on here? So in the paper, they admit, we initially estimate um, polynomials of order one, two, three, and four. We find that the results using the polynomial of order two are the strongest. This is overfitting. So just eyeball the data. You fit a polynomial of order one, which is just a linear, like a straight line. There's nothing there. It's flat. But if you try two, you get that gap. So again, this is just an example of uh, overfitting uh, the data. It's also interesting. I looked up the uh, lead author. Um, and the lead author uh, on his uh, CV, he's got 15 papers trying to explain crash risk with different variables. So the idea here is that if you try enough variables, then you're going to get a significant uh, relation. Okay, so um, many of you know I'm Canadian and I couldn't help but um, be interested in a story that um, came out this year, a publication in a very high profile medical journal, the British Medical Journal. And so this study has to do with the outcome of the US election affecting the sex ratio, so male to female births, in the province of Ontario. Um, so again, this is a top journal. Uh, it's got a very high impact factor, very well respected. And essentially uh, what the researchers do is not just look at the overall population, but they divide it into um, uh, the population that is liberal leaning versus conservative leaning and argued that they should see um, a decrease in this ratio only for the liberals because they were very upset that Trump won in 2016. So that's the hypothesis. And the results are striking. The p-value is 0 0.006 for this analysis. So again, let's take a look. You don't need to be a medical researcher uh, to figure this stuff out. And indeed, um, it's interesting. Uh, I challenge all of you, take a look at the medical literature. Um, it's pretty easy uh, to understand this stuff. So here is the time series of the overall uh, sex ratio. And the overall average is uh, 1.06. So that's male to female. Uh, it's very stable. And this is the monthly data uh, for the province uh, of Ontario. And that's my home province. And you can see that the election is uh, in uh, marked there in November. Um, and they hypothesize that this change in the sex ratio actually happens five months later. 
So um, looking at the data, I don't see anything in particular, but again, they're gonna uh, slice and dice by political affiliation. So let's take a look. Uh, on the top right, we've got the liberal areas. And in the, um, the bottom right, we've got the conservatives. And again, um, looking at these data, um, it's not clear eyeballing the data that there's anything there. Um, in addition, almost all of these dots fall within plus or minus two standard errors. There's like one observation that's just a little bit outside of that. But it really depends on the model you fit. And the model they fit is the following. So you estimate before and you estimate for the five months after. And you can see that at the dotted line, which is uh, five months out, that there is a significant uh, difference. So this is where the p-value comes from, uh, 0 0.06, 0 0.006. And this is the sort of stuff that gets published in a very top journal. Not in our field, but nevertheless, we've seen many examples like this uh, in our field. Okay, so let's kind of go back uh, to out of sample. This is the uh, example I showed you from the GF model where I questioned whether it was really out of sample. And look, a good lesson here is there's really no out of sample other than kind of live trading. So for example, if I fit a model to 2005 and then hold out the next 15 years, I've already lived through the global financial crisis. I know what happened in the global financial crisis, and that's going to change or impact the choices that I actually make in the modeling. So this is a paper that won first prize, the best paper in the Journal of Financial Economics and Investment. And this was just recently announced. And take a look at this table. So it says out of sample factor performance. So not in sample, out of sample performance. And look at the uh, model with six factors. And look at the out of sample sharp ratio, 4.05. Okay, so just to be clear here, um, this roughly means that for the same volatility as the stock market, this investment would earn about 60, that's six zero percent per year. Okay, so this just can't be. And it's remarkable that uh, this is even referred to as other sample. This is just another example of overfitting. There's also fraud. And um, I think fraud is not as common in financial economics uh, as it is in other uh, fields. In medicine, it's really all over the place. And this is an example of basically 121 Chinese papers uh, being red flagged. The images that they were using were basically all uh, the same image, a stock image. And essentially these researchers contract out to a paper mill and uh, the third party basically writes the papers, submits them to journals and tries to get publications for the authors. And I guess presumably these authors get promoted or move to better jobs. So this is the stock uh, image, and you can see that different researchers used it in different ways. So um, the number two shows a subset of this image that was actually used in, in a pretty good journal. Um, and, and again, there's many of these uh, different pieces of the uh, image that are used for uh, publication by other people. So these are just completely fake uh, publications. And uh, it's a, a really striking example uh, that many areas of science are really fundamentally uh, broken. Okay, so uh, I'm getting close to the end of my presentation and um, I want to kind of reflect on the sort of lessons here. So, let me talk about Rudy Giuliani. 
So he made these statements that seemed ludicrous in August of 2018. So one of them was the truth isn't truth. The other one was the truth is relative. The third one is that investigators may have different versions of the truth. Okay, so, and we know who Giuliani is, uh, President Trump's uh, attorney. And, uh, and uh, this, is, <laughs> this is a sort of picture that you might see in the more liberal leaning media. And this is the sort of picture you might see in the more conservative leaning uh, media. So I actually think that what he says is pretty accurate. So not that I usually disagree uh, or agree. Um, I don't really have a, a strong opinion here, um, but he was raked over the coals for this, but probably he shouldn't have been because it is a fact that even philosophers can't agree on what the truth is. And I've just subsetted um, a small group of the different theories of the truth. Okay, so we need to be really very careful when we say this is the truth. Okay, a lot of it just depends upon uh, the construct. And that's important to realize. Okay. So my last example is very appropriate for those interested in um, behavioral economics and behavioral finance. So in the past, I have been somewhat critical. Um, I've published in uh, behavioral uh, finance and economics, but we need to be really careful of all of these biases. So there are so many biases that it reminds me of the factor zoo, that if you try enough factors, you're going to find something that actually works. So we need to be really careful here. And this is a paper that got quite a bit of attention. So they were investigating fake news. So um, the idea is can we investigate why fake news goes viral? And the answer in the paper um, was striking. Um, it has to do with limited uh, attention, which is something in um, behavioral economics that is a big deal. So obviously, uh, given that fake news is in the news all the time and politicians use the word all the time, it's no surprise that this paper uh, goes viral into the 99th percentile of media coverage. It is picked up like all over the place. Um, and in and, and places like uh, Scientific American, which is not a tabloid publication, but a respected uh, publication that tries to distill in a very careful way um, the latest scientific advances. So this appears in Scientific American and uh, literally hundreds of other outputs until the papers retracted. So it's kind of ironic that the paper that is trying to explain fake news is fake. So let me conclude. So we've all heard, let the data speak. Indeed, when I was a student at the University of Chicago, it would be um, often the case that we would hear the professor say, when we're studying our paper, well, let's go to the data. Let's go to the tables. And you'd look at the tables uh, individually. And basically, your read of the table would kind of, uh, for an empirical paper, uh, 
tell you what's going on without actually looking in detail uh, at the text. So you kind of avoid the author's bias by looking at the tables directly. But the data do not speak. The tables uh, do not speak. Those tables are designed by the researcher. They're reporting what they want to report. So it turns out, and uh, hopefully uh, this is obvious by this point, that it's the interpreter of the data that speaks, not the data itself. And the interpreter often has an agenda. And there is a set of tools that that researcher can use to basically support the narrative. And indeed, you know, I've talked about this uh, before, that in academic research, the best chance of getting a publication in a top journal is to have a significant result that journals don't want to publish papers with non-results. Those types of papers don't get citations. It doesn't help the journal in terms of impact factors. So that creates an incentive to mine the data, to try to get that significant result. So we need to be careful. And this is especially the case in finance. We're now in this era of big data. The data we have today, um, we couldn't have dreamed of uh, 10 years ago. The computing power, the number of predictors, the methods that are available to us, the computing resources. And you all need to put that in the context of the incentives to strategically manipulate the data and uncover what we might call a convenient truth. Convenient in that it supports the narrative of the research. This is important for academia. It's important for the practice of management too. It's often the case that some academic paper uh, shows uh, a result and practitioners are eager to replicate that result and wrap an ET up around it and then sell the product saying, well, this is based upon peer reviewed scientific research. Well, let's be careful there. We've seen plenty of examples of peer-reviewed research that was overfit. And when something's overfit, you know what happens. It looks great in sample, and then it fails badly in the other sample. So I think, again, um, this is a situation that is more important today than it was in the past. It was in the past just more difficult to do data mining. Today, it is incredibly easy to mine the data. So it's much more dangerous. So um, in the end here, I would like to put a plug into my latest uh, paper called Faults and Misdiscoveries in Financial Economics. Uh, it was uh, published in the October uh, 2020 uh, Journal of Finance, and it directly addresses uh, these problems. And it really focuses on what um, is kind of a, a minimum hurdle for establishing something that is significant. I also explore um, the relative costs of type two and type one errors. And this is something that we don't really think about uh, that much in finance. So a type one error is to hire um, a manager that you thought was skillful, but is not. And a type two error is to basically reject a skilled uh, manager by mistake. 
So uh, that's available. And uh, indeed, um, reach out to me. Um, I'm available on SSRN and, uh, and LinkedIn.